Welcome. This is the April 16th Jail and Zones production user call. We have Rod, Nick, Jan, DCH, Joseph, and myself, Michael. And uh, Doug cannot join us. He is presenting this morning at the Open Container Summit. I believe that's the name of the Microsoft. No, actually, sorry, Linux Container, Linux Foundation event in Seattle. Third one's a charm. And I have some off topic topics, but Jan has been working on jail configuration build up through perhaps the nifty new dot include. Jan, let her rip. So uh, because I prototyped this on an older system that's actually not using uh, dot include, I have to split it up. But uh, it's possible to just take uh, basically do what you would normally do in on other platforms in something like a Docker file or something to have the jail.conf basically provision the jail, including creating the ZFS uh, data sets for it and so on, installing packages from package base and so on. But you just basically on startup have a bunch of is this precondition satisfied? If not, try to uh, fulfill it. If it fails, uh, fail the whole jail. Uh, so you basically build up your own little item potent uh, function for each task uh, in a hook and then run the hooks for jail.conf uh, in succession. And yeah. Do you want to share your screen and give us a quick tour? No. Okay, because so I'm... what's the heavy lifting on this? It's purely jail.conf and you trust it to spit out, say, uh, ZFS data set creation? And friend? Not spit out, but perform it as perform. Thank you. Prepare. That's a scientific term. Okay. As in uh, my, so I am in the process of feeling it up so that I have um, a jail.conf where I have my include uh, whatever dot dot slash defaults.conf where I define things like the ZFS pool to use and where in the file system my jails live. So that, and then the rest is just picked up from there. Okay. So then I would have, and because includes up to a certain depth, I think 32 as the one uh, Jamie compiled in can in, again, recursively include each other. You can mix and match and then have one to just do the storage, one to do the package based stuff, one to create, and um, in doing that, I found out uh, that it works really well to uh, basically have this jail ZFS layout where you have your jail not as the ZFS root object, as in my pool slash jails and then the jail name directly, but then you have underneath that unmountable file systems, which only I intended to um, untangle the jail file systems into uh, persistent and non-persistent parts or parts generated by different helpers uh, so that you can then uh, just wipe one of the subtrees uh, and on the next start of a jail, it will be uh, recreated. Hmm. Why test this on 13 if that include is... Uh, because uh, I have a system which isn't going to move to 14 as soon and I okay. want it there. Cool, cool, cool. Reasons. Reasons, I understand. Not a, got, not I'm particularly right. good ones. Okay. Uh, is there any syntax you want to drop in chat or otherwise, or we shall stay tuned and uh, check it out? I have uh, something which does not uh, contain syntax errors, I might. <laughs> Cool. Okay. I, I am in a similar situation on my imagined work, but I've made huge progress this last five days. Cool. Anything else, Jan, networking related <laughs> or otherwise? Cool. Uh, Joseph had a uh, very good question that I don't have the answer to in chat. And is this Jan, is this syntax I can share? Found the mute button. You're muted. Can I share that? Can I share that? So Joseph had a great question, which was, are there OCI-related efforts on Illumos and, say, OmniOS and Friends? 
or does oxide have an initiative? I personally can't answer that. Tosterson could be quite good at answering that. And Andrew, who will probably be in tomorrow, might have an answer. But uh, so that said, Joseph, have you heard of anything to date? I have not. I mean, it's it sounds like the sort of thing that MNX or, you know, Joint might have done in the past. Uh, but I or it's something around smart OS, but I, right. I I don't know if anyone is doing that. But um I'm I'm more asking like I don't know how the approach for OCI containers is happening on FreeBSD. And so I don't understand like is it deeply tied to Linuculator or is it um are are they still running FreeBSD binaries in, uh, okay. Um, yeah, so that's that's the question. It's sort of like, what what is the expectation from the OCI runtime on FreeBSD? So I can imagine what that might look like in an Illumis equivalent. It's almost a fork or no. Um, the runtime and that image specification can carry different payloads, and you can have through their convoluted set of standards, you can have a FreeBSD jail running on a FreeBSD uh, host, or you can have um, a Linux branded jail running on FreeBSD if it only uh, uses a system called the kernel implements close enough. So, yeah, both is possible. Um, but you run into issues if you, for example, want to use something like system D inside of that, because then it requires on uh, more C group semantics when free BSD uh, we implemented. So I see that makes sense. Sort of taking this to see is basically um, aiming for equivalent support. So as, as you would use Podman on, on Linux, then you should be able to do so with um, with FreeBSD. So native FreeBSD containers, native, which is just jails, well, jails mm -hmm. plus the, the same sort of incantations. Most of this works already. So the link I threw in there um, covers almost all of this. I've got some additional notes from Doug um, from, I think, from this week with fixes and things to try out. And it's getting closer and closer and closer. So... Um, this is very much my work in progress docs. You're welcome to share it, but what will happen is I'll, I'll get it all working and then we'll move it into um, uh, probably a, a um, something on the FreeBSD docs website, um, like, a, like a specific article. Um, but so far it works just like you'd expect. You can fetch containers and make containers and um, run them. And um, I'm just working through some of the finer details of can we sign them so that we have a, like a nice trusted release engineering sort of provenance? Um, what else? I haven't figured out some of the networking yet, but Doug says it should be possible. Maybe I'm just not holding it right. Uh, but it'd be great to have other feedback on this and for other people to try it and um, sort of see where they can take it. I only needed a couple more things left and then I can replace my current um, IO cell infrastructure with um, uh, a Podman based one and move to the future. Unlike yeah. um, unlike um, the container storage uh, interface, which is a bunch of uh, complicated RPC uh, schema to answer on, uh, the CNI, Container Network Interface uh, API, should be a bit simpler to implement because it's just a little bit of JSON instead of all this binary serialization. And yeah, so it's probably doable to have a bunch of different FreeBSD specific ones okay. for different kinds of uh, network virtualization to use with JS. To be super clear, what's the role of the Linux later? Is that optional and occasional or like all the time? From all I've seen, optional. Okay. So you I mean in the um in the uh, for a Linux problem stuff? Yeah, it's it's totally optional. Um, okay. you, you you don't need it at all. You don't need to do any like 
KLD load, Linux 64, or anything like that. It just all works with native FreeBSD stuff. Um, if you want to run a Linux gel, then you have to, you know, you have to run the Linux later. But I, I think this is more of all cool it works rather than, okay, I would base my business around having this work. The main issue you have as always is um, many things assume that they'll get PID1 in the container. Many things assume that there's some sort of system D thing there. Mm -hmm. um, and many things assume they've got C groups and other Linux specific functionality, which isn't there. So um, yeah, I think it's cool for showing people that it works and then that's it. So I think we talked repos and such last time. Yeah. Now, is there a meaningful repo for FreeBSD user lands, et cetera, and pre-configured Jail, so not, not we're not yet. relying on Linux compatibility. Yeah. So the, the, um, again, Doug's made a, a an, off, an awesome little um, script that builds these um, releases for you. And um, what we are hoping is that we can get these working through with the release engineering team to have those available. I'd really like to have at least a manually crafted one all the way through the fourteen point one beta cycle. Um, and whether we can release that as a proper thing for 14.1 release is a question that we can only answer having tried it. I honestly don't think it's this it's that hard. It, it took me half an hour to go through Doug's stuff and go, oh, okay, I can make an image. And most of this is about the um, the rest of the iceberg under the water that I don't know about, what release engineering needs, how their stuff works precisely, how official tables get generated and how we will, how we would the how we would hook into that. Um, but that's that's what we'd like to get to. Um, from a really practical perspective, the minimal possible solution here that involves the least amount of work is where at the end of the sort of normal current FreeBSD release process, we have tables of FreeBSD, we have package base available and normal packages built and we would run one additional sort of make filey scripty thing that will produce a couple of tarballs locally in the release engineering contained environment they would export those as a uh, like as a single oci container it's an artifact that we can then sign and we can store that just like we do with the dvd package uh DVD images, all the other sort of tarballs, and then people would be able to import that into their own environment. Um, but I would actually rather we go straight to to the exciting bit where we publish those repos, uh, sorry, those, those um, directly on a site like GitHub or um, some other container registry, okay. and then people can pull them themselves from there. And then the um, next step is is obviously to create a whole copy of Linux servers.io and have a whole <laughs> bunch of easy to use containers for self hosting nerds. Yeah. But I, I, you know, that's I'm, that's the dream. I think this would be really, really cool for a fork of Freenas. Um mm -hmm. that that to me is I was thinking about what is the use case for containers? So much of FreeBSD we're used to building artisanally ourselves the entire environment. But um, I think this would be really cool for, for, for free NAS stuff where people can make a container and then pull in the thing that they want, the Plex or whatever. I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, now that we have the option to use uh, includes with globs inside of the jail block in jail.com, and we can already do that just with plain jail.com that you would have a Git repository, for example, with curated snippets. And one of them could be the install and en Nginx with Let's Encrypt. The next one would be uh, install Plex, whatever. And it should just uh, then install correctly, or if you do it in a shell script uh, in one of the exec dot whatever hooks, um, it can all be done. The problem is that you have to make sure it's unimportant by carefully writing scripts, which 
is error prone if you do it in pure shell and reusing the shell part is not really easy right now because to have access to the gel.conf uh, variables and parameters, um, you either um, have to um, put a bunch of boilerplate in to export all of the variable bindings as a shell script and then slurp in your normal uh, shell script from a file, or you have to double escape it once as a string in jail.conf and then as a uh, shell script, the values you need. Uh, the latter is more flexible, but um, it gets annoying. Um, so yeah, what we could use here is a probably less than 100 lines change in the jail command to make it possible to say which uh, variables you want to be exported as environment variables to the hooks. And then it would be so much easier to write because if you do then only have in your exec dot, basically exec uh, dot prepare plus equals, and then inside you would have a trivial constant script like dot space, a relative path to a script, to slurp in a script, and have none of the uh, quoting horror. Um, yeah. But said, if you accept this quoting horror, um, then oh. you can do it with what's in 14 space system and a version control system of your choice. Cool. Welcome, Daniel and Chris. Do you have topics you want to address? You can read the notes of what we've been up to. Nothing off the top of my head, but I'll probably think of 74 things in 30 minutes. Oh, fantastic. I mean, you. the alternative which we could also do is to have, we already have the option in the jail command to read the configuration and dump it in a human-only format, mostly. But if we were to change that into dumping it out as something which is easily machine-readable, uh, that would also uh, satisfy this use case because then you could at least dump it somewhere under the run and reference it with, let's say, uh, UCL, CMD, JQ, or whatever to read it back in, it would be a bit less efficient, but also possible. And then you could delegate that to a little helper, which yeah, would of course mean you spawn one more process for each uh, hook. Yeah, it would be nicer to put it in the command directly. Uh, I had a thought the other day please. Um, that wasn't OCI, but it was flat pack. Um, so one of the appeals of Mac and Windows is that they have lots of support for older applications, even when they do crazy things under the hood. Um, you know, they can switch to an NT kernel, or they can switch to a mock kernel, and Mac 9 binaries will continue to work, or Windows and uh, 95 binaries will continue to work. Um, and part of that is the application isolation that they package it up in. And, and Unix is just, anything System 5 has never done that. They You trust the linker. But Flatpak kind of changes that. And I've been wondering, in terms of emulating Linux applications, what it would look like to have actual Flatpak emulation via jails. Like, has anyone mm -hmm. looked into what those, how they work? I know that there's C groups, I know that there's um, file system implications, but. So the question is, what do you really want from it, uh, because um, there are also big downsides to this uh, mechanism you're describing. Uh, one mm -hmm. of them is the Windows DLL hell, 
where you don't mm -hmm. know which version of the library is used by what and why you have two dozen different versions of OpenSSL on your workstation. Um, it's and true. only one of them has uh, all the latest patches, of course. Um, but the other problem is um, that yeah, you can't do it easily on the system exactly like that. Uh, FreeBSD's uh, fork, PCBSD, had an interesting idea because they were going for the desktop uh, PC uh, use case. So they wanted something as easy to use as a DMG uh, file on a Mac where you just drag and drop uh, and everything works. The implementation though was a bit more allergen where basically you package applications up in such a way that they are, um, that the install file contains all the dependencies, which makes the uh, installers big, but that's not too much of an issue anymore. And then at install time, you dedupe it into hard links for all the read-only files, which is all the libraries and executables, and have a content address cache of the original and then hard links to that, and use a wrapper with the right linker paths so that you can run it. And then you can have, for example, different versions of GNOME and KDE tools uh, without, so you can then use or QT5 and 6 or whatever is the issue in your system right now. And so that the different applications don't have to have the same uh, library versions. Um, you can do something like that all without uh, using jails. The problem with using jails to avoid having to teach the linker and maybe even the applications themselves what their uh, relative paths are and so on uh, is that you can't remove certain security features from jails via configuration alone. An extreme example is that uh, a jail process is never able to load a kernel module unless there's a exploitable kernel bug. Um, more realistic issues are things like running uh, xorg in a jail is a problem because the driver may have to have access to slash dev mem or kmem to uh, initialize the GPU or to effectively share uh, pin memory buffers. Mm. Okay, so like all the DMA stuff would be... Or... Out, it out depends completely on your use case. You can have an annex if you don't, uh, and how uh, picky your driver is about what it delegates dangerously into the application processes. Uh, it used to be a lot worse uh, before KMS and so on, mm -hmm. that uh, XORC itself would, would by default open DevMem and directly poke from user space into. Uh, GPU memory map registers to even do things as simple as uh, change the resolution or, yeah. Um, that's no longer quite as bad. But um, so these are the restrictions you would have to work with. And the other one is how do you mirror it and what is actually the use case you want it to show up as. Do you want, for example, uh, something big like a desktop environment, let's say KDE or GNOME, to be one of these? Or do you want each application outside of them, the default file manager, the PDF reader, whatever, do you want each of them to be a jail? Um, what is if they expect to share state, which is then isolated. You could probably uh, rearrange it all with enough nullfs mount points. Uh, hopefully you don't need a dynamic uh, union FS because then you're out of luck unless you are prepared to go uh, through fuse because um, yeah, don't use uh, the existing base system union FS. Um, But it should be possible to build something like that. The other thing is, in 14, at least, we have uh, 
the TARFS. So there's now a driver which can directly mount reverse uh, archive format to mount. Um, it even supports that STD compression, but the downside of using a TAR uh, as your um, exchange format for images is that TAR is not uh, seekable or indexed. So you have to sequentially scan for the header for each file and then scan over the content for the next uh, file and so on. So um, basically finding the files is slow if you have lots of files. Um, and then you have to aggressively cache the read-only file system to make performance bearable. Uh, it would probably be better to use something simple like UFS as your um, exchange format and then just use an MD pseudo device because then you can have a densely uh, packed UFS with something like GMU zip underneath so that you have a ZSTD compressed UFS file system read only mounted. Um, if you're prepared to commit to ZFS, then you could also do the same with ZFS replication streams, but that's a big attack surface, but not be, uh, as bad as mounting file system images from random sources. So yeah, you have lots of options here. Or you could use a tar as an exchange format and then locally convert that in your preferred format, which is what you can actually already do with the FreeBSD package manager because uh, of package triggers. So that you can have a port install a trigger file, which then instructs the package manager. If it modifies any file matching this trigger condition. It will also run the triggers Lua script, which can use uh, API functions to run arbitrary commands, either inside or completely out, uh, unsandboxed. So you could uh, use that to regenerate your, um, for example, your local ZFS snapshot you then clone. So Joseph, do you have an exact use case that you wish were solved, even if it's for a single application? Or are you broadly thinking, what could this look like? I uh, so the the specific use case I am looking for yeah. is um, I how do you enable easy migration away from Linux and in theory uh, Flatpak applications are self contained enough but I don't know enough about them I just have been hearing more and more about them. Um, I mean, that's it's completely divorced from the life that I that I live. Like I'm I'm either dealing with Docker containers or OS tree if I have to do Linux containers. Uh, so I don't I don't know anything about what Flatpak looks like. But I've been thinking about the upgrade experience for Windows and Mac and how they've managed to do major kernel changes. And what that would look like if we wanted to ena enable someone to migrate to FreeBSD or Illumos. Like, what what would a transparent upgrade look like? And it would it's, it's obviously look like boot environments, like ZFS boot environments. And um, what truly got up Apple forward here is that they uh, are basically shipping snapshots as operating system updates, and then they uh, at boot time pick the latest valid one. Hmm. So that you, the root uh, file system on a modern Mac, unless you go into the uh, boot code and disable the so-called system integrity protection mode, uh, which they loudly warn you against, then hmm. you, uh, normally your root file system is mounted read-only and they implemented something uh, quite strange called a firm link, which is somewhere in the middle between a hard and a soft link. And uh -huh. statically configured, uh, basically it allows them to specify where the mutable directories are overlaid on top of the read-only file system. And it's done for a configuration file. 
I remember correctly. So it's basically a config file, but it's not really a mount. It looks like it's part of, you suddenly have writable directories in a read-only file system. And that's okay. a bit strange what they're doing there. Interesting. Are there any so what happens design is that docs or white, or white papers on this, or you've just figured that out? Probably. I figured it out uh, on breaking Max and making sure that I can still do what I used to do. Uh, there is a WWDC video uh, from 2018, 2019 on when they first released FirmLinks that is available to watch. Um, now, that they'll talk about the from link there, but if you talk, but if you want more information, like on what is immutable, that's uh, that's built into the dialibs, uh, and that's during boot time that they don't necessarily show and they don't want you to know. Um, that well, is something that we're looking into right now, too. If I remember oh, right, correctly, they added that in macOS 10.15. So Catalina was the first macOS to have a by default read-only file system as root so that you don't have to run, fix up uh, owners and permissions every few weeks because applications are misbehaving and you delegate it root to everything because you click the pop-up, yes, I want to progress with my work, get out of the way uh, a few times too often. Hmm. Um, so, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, as long as you um, have a directory or, or a file system entry of a right file type, so normal files would work as well, starting with FreeBSD 13.2, you can use NullFS to do something similar. And there's no file based on NullFS, which yeah, is kind of Yes, kinda exactly. Cool. The, the, um, the really... Uh, and, annoying implication of having a single file without a surrounding a directory as a mount point is that you cannot atomically update it with the normal write mm -hmm. attempt file and rename in the same directory because the containing directory is on a different file system. Mm -hmm. So you have to rely on the fact that uh, Unless you crash on a file system that isn't a ZFS, a big write system call is atomic. Um, so um, yeah, you have to basically prepare it all and then do one big write system call to replace the file, uh, which isn't a problem for things like configuration files, but you don't want to do it for, I don't know, your big video file or something. Mm -hmm. because it takes yeah. Interesting. Uh, Dave, you had some comments on, say, leveraging Linux-based browsers and other... Oh, so you can watch uh, certain popular streaming sites, maybe? I don't know. Sorry, which one? I think we were going back a bit here for that. Here uh, we are. Yeah. It's, I'm just it's going here. down the list. Yeah, about... Yeah, this is about flat pack. So... This is more of the question about what is the problem we're trying to solve? And it's, are we going down the path of going, here's some technology I have over there. Could we have that over here too? Maybe. What's the problem Flatpak is trying to solve? And it's very much a, a Linux problem that we don't have on FreeBSD. So the, the, the problem is you have multiple applications that are built on different Linux kernels, different Linux distros, and their libraries don't all match up. So you want to have them running. Um, you want a way, let's say you're Ubuntu, or so yeah, um, Canonical or Red Hat, and you want to build Firefox just once for all the different flavors of Firefox you have, and you want any Linux distribution to be able to just fetch that that type of that binary and use it directly. So it's an application distribution problem. And in the FreeBSD world, we have the solve because we have ports. So everything is built consistently. And even if you want to build your own ports, our port system is designed such that you can pull in the pre-built packages from FreeBSD and um, so the, the official package mirrors, and you will have the right libraries available to you to build off. So it's kind of a problem we don't have. 
but what I was wondering about is um, how would that look if we wanted to use um, Linux Firefox or Linux Chromium? At the moment, the way you do this is from some um, um, amazing scripts built by someone whose who's real world name I can't remember. Um, but you, you, you build all of those things yourself um, by downloading and unpacking a, a Linux distribution. Um, and it would be pretty cool if we could do provide those Linux-based Firefoxes or Chromium um, to users on FreeBSD through some sort of process. Um, maybe, maybe that's um, a place where uh, yeah, flat pack type stuff would work. But I, I think again, flat just uh, stack containers, stack tables. Um, so yeah. Um, there are already Linux, Chrome, uh, and Firefox ports. And it's been a while since I tested it, but it used to be possible to just, for example, use the uh, DAM DRM plugin for them and have HTCP uh, protected uh, video fallout of your uh, screen with Xorg. I think the Linux um, ports are gone. The, the whole point is that people could watch Netflix, Amazon, whatever streaming video service they want. Um, and yeah, it'd be great to have something that makes that easy. And maybe that's a flat pack type thing. Hmm. So there was a local plug meeting on flat pack and I'll try to find the video, but I, I remember leaving with the feeling of just power grab. And I don't know why that was, I don't know the exact uh, details, but it was like, let's make everything our extremely specific way. And we're so, so sorry if that doesn't work for you. But the big you. problem with uh, the whole approach is that suddenly the one releasing the flat pack is responsible uh, for the whole transitive hull of dependencies, which normally means that they only update their application uh, and the dependencies get updated whenever it causes uh, the ancient version they're shipping uh, causes build issues. Um, so the, it's been, I think, almost two years, but uh, came across an interesting blog article where someone did the analysis uh, with not just Flatpak, but also Snap and App Image and found out that the most common big applications shipped this way are all shipped with uh, totally outdated dependencies just because uh, the application still works with them. Who cares that your lib, uh, whatever, um, has a parser which hasn't been uh, updated in years and uh, has like three remote code execution vulnerabilities okay, in okay, your okay. image parser. Uh, and you're pointing that parser at uh, images on the web, right? Oh. So. Yeah. Thank you. For for, I used to watch the um, flat pack, a, a normal, um, like a, a normal Ubuntu user, so not a power user, not someone who's familiar with open source distributions and is happy scripting, but someone who's been told Ubuntu is a great choice. For a, for you for a first time Linux, the flat pack stuff is really really complicated and makes a huge mess. All sorts of subtle things like put these files in your home directory um, doesn't work anymore. The containers are, are segregated. There's Jan, Jan mentioned out the updates are not good. Um, it's a terrible terrible user experience still. Um, yep. And I'm sure it'll get fixed. I would dis disagree about the user experience because. For user experience, uh, the question is, who is the user you are considering? Are you considering the end user or the distribution maintainer or the one maintaining a big application for multiple Linux distributions? No, Especially I'm, I'm just, this I'm last group the end uh, user. is really hard. The human. Yeah. And potentially the human end user is also helped by this approach because they can be just click at it and expect it to be available, even if they update something else. 
it doesn't break uh, the application which doesn't have an active maintainer anymore. Uh, of course, that also means that you execute all the unmaintained code. Uh, but at least it still does, among other things, what you expect it to do. Does that answer your question, Joseph? Somewhat. I mean, it's the... It, it, it tells me that, that Flatpak is not the answer, but... Um, it's just, it's interesting that there's no, I keep trying to think about Linux like I think about uh, System 5 and how did people, <laughs> how did people get, um, how do people move past it? Like how, how do we create space for other things that are not, um, run exclusively by experts and and wh what does that migration path look like and i would love for process isolation to be part of that story um and yeah that's that's all uh it, it so sounds like flat pack is as painful as i have heard so yep that's uh <laughs> You're probably not, not going to find the true flat pack experts in this group. This uh, but uh, it, it's probably a um, design point worth considering when you are about looking into implementing something for your use case. Learn from their mistakes and maybe also from their accomplishments uh, if you can reproduce it. But um, And one quick comment is that based on your description of it, it sounded like, oh, Docker shipped my machine because of all these dependencies and such. So it's like, mm, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. It's basically the, I need a static environment instead of an executable, but unlike Docker, which ships the whole user land as a single static executable, it only ships an application and all its dependencies as one file. Mm. And then I think mounts it. I don't know. What are they using? Is it a squash FS and an overlay? Or I have never looked that deeply under, under the hood, only dealt with it, uh, dealt with it in virtual machines yes. when stuff didn't work and Google until you find the right workaround to make it work again. Like, no, you can't put that in your home day. If you do, you have to put a sim link to that file in your home dear there as well. Uh, yes, this, the, in essence, this is this is the thing. The idea of making software even easy to distribute for sysadmins and application developers is a good one. The concrete implementation of what happens for a user who wants to get something from their VS Code container into another container or downloaded a file in Firefox and wants to get it into another container is not a good experience. So, um, and yet it's fixable. Well, yeah. An extreme example with high security uh, um, goals would be something like Cubes OS. Even if it's built on top of data technology, it's still a rather um, secure design. Um, uh, even I was annoying. I actually, I actually just joined late from oh, my cool. class just to give a comment on that, that one of our student Students, one of our students made a, a Cubes OS style uh, desktop based on FreeBSD and JLs, where basically everything, including Xorg, apparently can be run in a JL as I long do as tell. you do the, okay. Yeah, I asked him to write a blog post or, still, or at least like do the documentation about it. But basically, he's running Xorg in a separate JL. He's also running Pulse Audio in a separate JL. Uh, he's running um, a Firefox in a separate jail, and his development environment in a separate jail. So, like, he's doing cubes, like, and he's using Jailer, by the way. I totally forgot to say oh. that. So, that was like very easy to do, like, a clone and you know, all of that management with that. 
Um, a lot of use with NullFS, to, according to what he told me, to you know NullFS, you know, like home directories and stuff like that. Uh, for example, let's say Pulse Audio doesn't need the home directory, so there's no need for that. It just needs like tempfs or like some specific files, etc. Uh, same with Dbus. Uh, a lot of hacking around Dbus to make a lot of things work, apparently. Um, and one last thing that he told me, I'm trying to remember about. Oh yeah, and he also did um, a separate uh, jail for networking. So like a jail, a VNet enabled jail that has the firewall inside of it. Everything goes through that jail because Cubes OS does it that way as well. I had no idea. Um, where he passes the uh, the, uh, the the EM zero interface, the the Ethernet to that jail, and that mm. jail does all of the netting and everything else. So everything does is done with bridges. Uh, pretty, he's been pretty happy with the setup, but like there seems to be some interesting questions. Can Wi-Fi be vnetted? Uh, if anyone knows, maybe you can answer later. And one thing he also wanted me to add because I told him I'm going to the jails call. Um, let me try to. I should have taken notes when he was talking, but no, Bring I asked him to do documentation. Maybe by the end of the week, we'll have a, That's cool. a good, yeah. And it, it seems uh, also rep, uh, um, replicatable. Like the idea is to have this for like, let's say scientists. That was one of the common concerns because scientists enter a lot of websites and it might have malware. So can we like do a separation between the jail that connects to the SSH and the jail that does web browsing and stuff like that. So. Um, and if it goes well, I might actually deploy it like on government scale because hmm. luckily we don't use laptops, so I'm not worried much about the hardware. Yeah. And since it's everything is an old desktop with like a very bad Railtech or Intel NIC <laughs> that at least just works, so it might be a good, interesting use case for his um, local community to, to to try that. Anyway, sorry, I'll be idling. If anyone has any more comments, I'll be back soon. And um, thank you all. Cool. It's you all. You. I, it's been a while since I joined the call. Yeah, we have great turnout too. Um, that said, briefly on PCBSD, I thought they also mentioned uh, jailing up applications pretty institutionally, like Antony just described. Um, so anyway, uh, perhaps enough on that, unless you have questions. So here's a 2000, uh, some time ago, posts on it. I'll grab some papers here. That all said, Chris, you have been unable to attend. I hope life is good. Do you have any updates? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Welcome. Uh, yes, I um, I unfortunately was a bit busy lately because I was out okay. traveling, but um, I don't really have that much news at the moment. Um, I have a couple things that I'm working on, but they're not really uh, focused on uh, jails and Beehive directly. No worries. Uh, what's the state of your VM state D? I need to manage things sooner rather than later. Uh, well, basically, um, my idea is to start looking back at development, hopefully, by let's say uh, hopefully end of April. I put okay. some notes also in the quarterly update recently um, well, with a cry for help sort of, because right now it's really just Jan trying stuff out. And um, I figure me just being the sole developer of this whole thing is not gonna work long-term, I think. Well, looking for help is a legitimate topic. Uh... Looking. Well, then I'll try to take a peek at that. Awesome. Thank you. And did you make it over to the container summit? Doug is at right now. And I think Greg is, or not so much. Cool. I'm guessing no. I was hoping to go there today, but yeah, no. Uh, Dan or Daniel, anything to report? I know you slipped in, Mr. Langell. No, nope, nothing here. Cool. Your systems are all treating you well. Upgrades are done. Yep. That, that, that was jails, but that was on AWS. Not that it's any less a freebie as JT jail, but. Um, oh, sorry. That upgrade, the database upgrade, yeah, that was entirely a AWS. No okay, freebie. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, 
New York. Daniel, did anything come to mind? I guess I I do have um, one question I meant to ask last week that I forgot. Uh, so, <clears throat> so when I want to shovel bits as as fast as humanly possible, what I what I tend to do is I create a like for, for web services. I create a web proxy that runs Hitch and Varnish, and I don't use VNet on it because I want to keep the LRO TSO. Um, which I think is the, which I think is the way to, the way to do it. Then you're, then you're shoveling your cash as, you know, as fast as that machine can actually do it. And, um, you know, not, not compromising in any way. I guess the, I guess the question is, I have a pair of firewalls at uh, three different sites now, um, like heavy firewalls. And, you know, the second one sort of just hanging out there. And I was thinking about running some VNet jails in there, um, not <clears throat> that aren't bound. Obviously, aren't would they would not be bound to the uh, to the real interfaces. But I've been shying away from putting any VNet on a box that's that's performing or, or that could potentially be performing that task. Um, but I guess if it's VNet, it's a whole other stack. There's probably and you know as long as it's not bound to the same interface. I'm using for all that bit shoveling, it should be fine. It shouldn't, it shouldn't affect the performance of the of the main um, interface, the real interface, right? If you have a good NIC, you shouldn't have to disable a TSO LRO. Instead, you should be able to create a additional virtual interface and pass that to your VNet uh, so that you use basically use the uh, um, the NIC as a switch. Um, and then you can have one instance running with LRO TSO disabled in hardware and another one with offloading enabled. So, okay, so when I've done that, when I've done, so if there's, if there's switching involved on the, this is precisely what I'm, what I'm talking about. If there's switching involved on the real interface, uh, performance takes a dive. Um, what kind of switching are you talking about? Like uh, either a uh, um, IF, IF bridge or a netgraph bridge. Oh, of course. Uh, then the performance tanks completely. About. What I meant is use a virtual function on the NIC and configure it into non pass through mode so that you get multiple virtual functions and then move those over into VNets. Okay. Okay. I get it. So so then, the, the then you time. should be only limited by your NIC slash driver and how many receive and transmit queues you have to uh, split up. And the the first the first question of whether or not the um, you know running running uh, virtual interfaces or other other interfaces without CSO or uh, LRO isn't going to bother the interface that does have it. Yep. Yeah, so these well, can also always be that you have a uh, annoying side channel there and uh, performance suffers. Uh, that has to be tested with an uh, actual system to find out if there are any hidden bottlenecks you discover that way. But you're totally right that uh, for a high bandwidth uh, appliance, um, you can't just throw in an IF bridge uh, and disable all of the batching and to store packet software virtual and expect it to perform well. We are certainly quite a way away from that. Um, so on my so so basically on my backup firewall, uh, move with caution. On my primary, maybe you just leave it alone. Uh, or you could do something different uh, you, because you probably don't want these jails to have the ability to uh, straddle multiple um, security zones, like bypass the firewall. Uh, so it may be a good idea if you can justify it to just get a good enough network card to put in the right switch and then just do a loop around through the switch and come back into the same system through a different NIC. 
hmm. and then the bridging overhead and so on. If you want to have lots of uh, it's like that would um, just yeah be specific to that um, system yeah. and the jail and the main data path would hopefully just run at full tilt without being burdened down by yeah there's locking but because uh, your main firewall does not contend for the hot locks or for the queue to send or receive packets uh, through, uh, it shouldn't suffer much. Um, of course, okay. it's inefficient by design, but uh, if you have the spare cycles, uh, you can use them that, like this and shouldn't run into uh, the congestion on your um, fast path through the system. And right. the other thing you could try, um, which um, is to not have a bridged network, but a routed network. If you're already comfortable running non-trivial firewalls, you're probably able to set up the right routing for it. And then just, um, that's the, the problem here. We don't have a equivalent to ePair, which uh, drops the ethernet because ePair, the Ethernet emulation is the reason why there is even code to have contention in. I would really like to see something just in IF pair, which is a la pure layer free interface, just an IP v4 and IPv6 point to point tunnel between VNets uh, with no uh, emulated layer one or two underneath, just a way to move packets over through an interface instead of through uh, PFIL hooks in the firewall. And yeah, that would also be nice, and probably not even much code to implement, but it would be an in-kernel driver. You can already do what I've described, but just not with a full performance advantage. Just I would like to see this approach I have uh, via NetGraph because NetGraph already can do IP uh, in various ways and doesn't care about uh, what it actually means uh, to be uh, an Ethernet packet or an IP packet. It's just messages between nodes in a graph. So you can totally use it for point-to-point -point IP interfaces. Yeah, you have so many right. options but probably none of them is perfect. <laughs> right. Or buy more servers. <laughs> oh, sure, firmware hardware is a problem. Uh, Dave, is that but, a good segue um, for your questions from KP and TJ? Oh, sure, yeah. So th three things. The stuff that Jan is talking about is called SR-IOV. Correct. And there's a great article about that on the uh, FreeBSD website, which just arrived in Michael's inbox. Thank and that's you. worth a lot. That's, that's the Are magic Are you talking stuff. about the uh, FreeBSD journal article from a while back? Yeah, and the later on the talk by Ryan, um, yeah. which I'll link to. The big problem with that uh, whole idea is... Uh, He's totally right that all of this is enabled by default in the base system. The caveat is for the drivers for which it's implemented. Mm -hmm. So it means that you need a physical network interface which supports this standard, which 10 gig and faster NICs normally do. Yeah. But even then, it needs to have the right hardware resources so that you can... Um, finally divide them up uh, without starving each virtual interface of resources like buffer uh, queues uh, and interrupts. And the next problem is that you need a chipset and yep. firmware for the chipset to make it all work correctly. Um, for example, for uh, AMD Epic, at least second generation, the problem is that the IO MMU driver uh, is unreliable. The next uh, issue is that all of the configuration has to be uh, replaced for the whole physical interface. So mm -hmm. you can't just have Beehive running or a VNet enabled jade running and then 
um, change the um, the statically assigned enforced MAC address the untrusted virtual machine can't spoof. Right, uh, that's what John is having trouble or with. Or unhide right? and hide it. So mm -hmm. uh, every time you uh, use IOV CTL to reconfigure the interface, the whole interface gets deconfigured. Mm. Uh, probably all the Beehive instances using it would crash unless the whole system comes down if you do that. Mm. Uh, or, or it refuses you to let you let you do it. But you can't, for example, update this configuration incrementally. Mm. Uh, and just the ability to yeah, yeah, sign... That's, that's um, you know, I just wanted to give people two links so they uh, can look up for more information. So yeah, John um, has described the issues uh, he's facing with that. In the Beehive calls minutes, you can find a recording okay, yeah. of his uh, description. Yep. Uh, if you don't want to dig through uh, a day or so worth of um, video uh, footage, Correct. so yeah, to so you find the right it out spot um, broadly. Uh, and the important part here is that he has to set the MAC address per. Um, because in his deployment, for good reasons, the MAC address belongs to the uh, virtual machine, and during code migration, it follows the machine, mm -hmm. and he wants the hardware to enforce that, so that uh, virtual machines may not okay. intentionally or accidentally spoof the MAC address. And that point of enforcement is the virtual interface uh, configuration. Mm. And every time he has to update that, he has to basically kill everything currently running do it and then start all of the virtual machines up. Of course, that's not possible. So because of that, he uh, can't use Beehive for his uh, requirements uh, because he needs, uh, unless uh, he can get by with software bridging. Right. I hope there's a PR and no, we don't, this is not solved yet. But thank you, Jan, for those insights. Uh, and Dave, is this unrelated to me trying to, last time trying to squeeze some like heat graphs out of where the bottlenecks are? So yeah, you're two things. KP and TJ. Go ahead. First one was a was a call to action. Please go and try my OCI notes work in progress and tell me um, if stuff is unclear or doesn't work or as a bonus if you get further and make it work even better. Um, it's getting to the stage where large parts of it are actually usable. And it'd be great to have some people come back and tell me what doesn't work. So from um, KP to Christoph um, yeah. Prowas and uh, TJ Tom Jones, um, so this is firewall and networking gurus and FreeBSD respectively, um, they get feedback like bridges are slow and stuff doesn't work. And we the, the response from them was, can we please have something more specific? Um, in other words, a specific use case where someone says, I get this at this interface between these two interfaces raw, and then I do the following things, and then it sucks. And here are the things I've tried. Um, I said if someone can come up with a um, an example where it doesn't work for them, I've got a list of 10, 12 things from, from Tom on, on how to get better results out of it, and I would love oh, for us to be able to bring this. Great. Um, but that's, that's the key thing. Um, we need to get specific about what does and doesn't work, and it needs to be done in a way that allows someone to reproduce it um, and therefore to to make advances on it. Um, I'm totally keen to do that. I picked up a couple of um, 100 gig NICs from, um, the, for want of a better phrase, fell off the back of a truck near the end of last year, and um, I'm really keen to see um, how, here you go, what sort of performance can I expect out of that? And that's a great environment to be able to hand back to someone else and say, okay, test it. Tell us what sort of um, uh, performance bottlenecks can be avoided here. So my classic use case is always going to be, I got a bunch of jails and between the jails, um, performance is not as great as between the hosts. That's what I'd like to see. Um, so anyone awesome. who's interested in that, please let me know. That's great. You can be a point person on this. I'm partly to blame for prodding them, but also my conclusion was, okay, fine. Let's just flame graph it, show it. Uh, I believe uh, KP suggested uh, the PMC tools rather than Dtrace to yes. uh, help reveal mm -hmm. that. And Antoinette pointed out not too long ago that the bridge is so old that there are virtually no Dtrace hooks for it. So that was enlightening. Um, yeah. 
So I, I can't remember the exact conversation any, anymore, but I think the guts of it is Bridge is not as bad as you think it is. Um, he's improved it, that's for sure. Please, please tell me Please tell me what you're trying to do. Let's write it down and turn it into an issue and okay. get some stats on it. Yeah. I've got hardware here I can put okay. to one side and do regular tests on, and it's something I'm keen on learning more about. Um, don't know if it's new hardware, yeah. Michael. It's hardware. Dave, do you oh, have hard, uh, oh, well, it's new to you. <laughs> is the okay. traffic sync and source as well? So you probably need three physical systems, all of them with good network cards, and it would be nice if we are connected to a fast enough switch so that the switch isn't a bottleneck. Yeah, I don't have a hundred gig switch, but I've got a I've got a ten gig, um, okay, a, 10, well, a good ten gig one, and I've got um, hardware up the wazoo for this. Yeah. So if you have uh, three physical systems with the good mix, uh, one of them slightly bigger preferentially so that it can be the one with a bridge and guess it's on, so that we can have basically a, a the rock of just bridging through the system and mm -hmm. running jails or beehive gets on the system and then having outside uh, or traffic coming into the virtual machine or in the opposite direction and then also on the system guest to guest uh, traffic. Mm. So the, all of these trigger different code paths which potentially have bottlenecks. When I looked at it and I didn't do it in a formalized manner, I just wanted to find out if there's something obvious I can do to improve performance just because if there are low-hanging fruits, I would have done it, but there weren't really that many low-hanging fruits to mess around with. The issue is that, yes, uh, Christoph did a really good work uh, moving the old uh, bridge driver from a single mutex per bridge instance so mm. that you really were contesting on that lock to Epoch, which helps a lot, but... Um, now you can only scale what is there. And the next problem is that the ePair driver also emulates Ethernet with all of the problems it has and has a virtual um, oh, a photo driver, Ethernet uh, frame uh, buffer and so on. And <laughs> oftentimes it's the ePair which holds back the um, VNet to VNet communication over a bridge. Yeah, we've uh, seen not the, the um, last not year. the bridge itself. Uh, it's just that the packet processing happens in the net ISR context, and then you're only uh, throwing that many CPUs at it. Um, so yeah. Okay, and yeah, for so so all of this virtualized stuff, there was talk. Uh, so there was a talk about it uh, at UBSD corner before I was, uh, I think, in 2015 or something. Uh, from the University of Pisa, uh, as part oh, of, of the NetMap work, uh, they looked yeah. into implementing GSO for FreeBSD, that is uh, generic segment offloading, mm. where you, um, and this is probably the design we would need to get good performance because what tends to happen, especially when the output the bridge has to look like a 1,500-byte uh, MTU interface is that you lose all your time doing all of the per-packet processing early. And if you could basically delay all of this until you hit a, a physical nick and hopefully there use either hardware or firmware assistance or just bite the bullet and do it in software once, in a big batch at the end. And before that, yes, you emulated a packet mm. switch network per packet, no fancy vectorized packet proce uh, processing, but you did it with 32 uh, kilobyte packets. And that's mm. also very useful. Mm. Things like vidio net, the interface specification, because it comes from Linux, already has support for GSO. Uh, in the uh, interface, it's just a feature flag that this Nick supports, <coughs> uh, which would mean that you could have a, a virtual machine using a VidIO.net interface, uh, which then sends a big packet like um, with LRO TSO, but also for things which potentially aren't, uh, yeah, 
I'm just TCP and uh, it would even work for UDP and maybe potentially if you implement it for other packet-based protocols. Uh, the one which will probably become relevant in a few years uh, would be quick or HTTP free because uh, you have to expect that HTTP free, which is based on UDP, will see bulk traffic. So that's an upcoming performance uh, yeah. nightmare that okay. suddenly you have to do hundreds of gigabits per second UDP. Let's keep it actionable yeah. to the developers within Reef. Yeah, so Jan, did you and I discuss that the multi queue tap interface might be one of our bottlenecks of choice? No, the we don't have a multi queue mode well, no. for tap. Is it the want for for want of one? Is that our but... tap is definitely a bottleneck in many cases. Okay. Yeah, yes. using it's a bottleneck. The hold is the question is are we talking about FreeBSD in general, jailed or just Beehive? So, so for, for me, the, the, the feedback I wanted to bring back was the message that you're giving back to these developers is collectively us is not actionable and it's not specific. Okay. Not, please, let's list, uh, make a list of all the things that could be wrong. They're well aware of many things that could be fixed. What they're yeah, after a simple is a specific use case. Let him finish. Let him finish. Yes, this doesn't work. I'm expecting it to be better. And then we can work on that. Personally, okay. I'm interested in the throughput from one jail um, out to the network versus not the jail out to the network. Um, but yeah. my infrastructure is not, I'm not IO, I'm not network IO limited, uh, but I'm definitely interested in having that better. Um, oh. Yeah, other people may have different stuff. As, as soon as the Beehive, um, um, ARM64 Beehive stuff is, is really, really unusable. I don't know, I've not followed it for the last few weeks, uh, months rather. Um, I'm very keen to see if, how, how well it works, yeah. Did you watch my short little video on that? Not yet, sorry. I'm a no, terrible okay. <laughs> That's the best I can do is to show everything I know and then drop some of it on the wiki and then keep yeah. refreshing the CGIT to see if the user land tools have sprouted yeah. more abilities. Uh, Stefano so, um, Garzarella hey. sounds like he's working on GSO. Does that sound right, Jan? I think so. When at least it was a name uh, which sounded so, Italian and which oh, I would dare try to pronounce correctly. Um, so, Dave, to get back to actionable stuff. Mm. So the reference use case, which is basically the, the, the value to compare against, would be something as simple as running iPerf on two systems, just host to host. And that's the optimum. Uh, you can't expect to exceed that. If you do, you have something very strange going on. Then the next part would be, yeah, that, that sounds right like the repository. So the next part would be to just on one side, uh, put it in a jail at all, alias based. You shouldn't see a big performance change there. You shouldn't I normally see any thing which shows up uh, in the benchmarking noise. So next you create a bridge um, on one system and put it in a VNet enabled jail. And you will see the throughput fall through, fall through the bottom. Um, just an e pair on a bridge, the physical network interface also on the bridge, the NIC configured how you have to, to make bridging work reliable. So if you do that, you will find that a modern ish not too slow desktop CPU gets you something like six or eight gigabits per second with a full MTU, which isn't that much. And Sorry, Jan, I think you've misunderstood the purpose of this. I wanted to raise to the group that the mm -hmm. feedback from the developers is they need a specific use case. So they're looking for someone who has a specific- And probably write shell scripts as reproducers for that. Okay, well, cool. So it takes a village and- uh, Yeah. I know, Chris, you've done some storage benchmarking for Beehive. So it's that kind of effort where we just map out and make it reproducible and share your script so others can run through some of it. I've given Chris a few. Jan, if you have any scripts, great. Rodney, I think you've moved a packet or two over the years, but I could be wrong. Um... Actually, I, uh, I plan to. 
Chris, we had you and lost you. Oh, he muted himself. Yes. So, Sorry, that uh, I'm pushing the wrong button. I don't worry. I'm actually I'm planning I'm planning to put my stuff on GitHub. Um, the thing is, it will probably need some additional documentation for handling. Let's say because uh, the way I wrote it right now is kind of hacky, but it works. Cool. And that was that's purely for storage, or did you also look at um, networking? That was actually purely for uh, for storage. Okay, cool. Well, so let's kind of complement his efforts with something network related. We've covered a lot of ground, and we're at yeah. uh, not quite a moose job, but getting there. In the time it gets takes from how far you can get from Portland in like an hour and a half, um, you get to moose job. So I have some. Uh, Topics for the future, I guess the next two calls on, it sounds like UEFI is falling out of FreeBSD because of old GCC. That would be bad, and I'd love to talk. Not UEFI, BIOS emulation. Oh, which The BIOS UEFI the, stuff is there. You're it's right, but just, the- It's the CSM. The CSM, the, okay. Well, yeah, but that's been a warning forever. Is that finally now hitting, it sounds like? Yes. It Got it, thank you for Two clarifying. days ago, I think, ah. uh, Mark has expired does not build anymore unless you remove it and restore the old uh, GCC because that ancient version of the UEFI with a working CSM, so with working BIOS emulation, uh, requires an even older version of GCC, namely GCC 4.8. Yep, yep, to build. got it. It's and gone or That it's one gone. got finally pulled from ports. Okay. Cool. Uh, thank you, Dave, for Olivier's examples. Great. Uh, actually, that looks like a link. Let's see what that bad boy's got for us. And Olivier has moved a packet or two over the years. So impact of adding an IF bridge. Oh, here we go. All righty then. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, great topic. Um, it's no longer as bad as shown in those numbers because that's, that's from FreeBSD 11. Okay, that cool. is when the bridge was and still using one lock instead of epoch. But the test uh, itself may bridge. still be valid. Thank you very much. The te test itself looks very valid and it's a great starting point. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Great find because it's it's like don't sit down and recreate all that if it's already created. Have a nice day. Uh, ba, 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 ba. I'll link that. I'll nuke the link. Yeah, it's just me doing housekeeping out loud because if I don't do it, it won't get done. I'll push those topics to the next calls. Anything else, gang? We are down to about seven people. Entrenig, I know we talked about moving to, say, routed networks. Maybe it's a bit too early to share anything, but that's a hot topic out east and west simultaneously. You're probably in a cool cafe on the street. A bit late for that. Um, we'll probably be closing up shop right now. Um, okay. But, okay, gang. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. Did you figure out your DHCP v6 prefix delegation issues uh, for the test non nonsense system? I hope to be on a genuine Comcast system ASAP, and that's why I've been pounding my head against uh, Imagine this last five days or so, plus taxes, plus all kinds of nonsense. It is 11.22. So um, anything else, gang, or shall I call it and maybe see some of you for open ZFS tomorrow? Um, Chris, if you wanted for um, the M state here, I can share with you the current state of the uh, um, LibUCL macros. Oh, right. That's what's been missing. Yeah, Correct. I saw yeah. that. Yeah. You saw that. You've, Good. Oh, I, you've I, I done, you've done a, a lot of work. I've seen that. Uh, and yeah. he's specifically asking some for polish. missing macros to jump in and moderate. <laughs> So you two connect on that. Uh, in your absence, Jan made a pretty honest, open call, and you can see in the three documents, like, "Hey, what you missing?" 
So thank you, Jan, for doing that. So Chris, you're probably in the best position <laughs> to, to understand what I've been uh, looking Messy, yeah, right? I, I've seen that. I've seen that in the notes. I, I didn't dig into the detail yet, but um, I've seen that you spent definitely a lot of time on that. Yeah. So what you can now do is uh, you I used uh, VM state D as the uh, example use case for it, but it would be applicable uh, if you if anyone was ever truly crazy enough to consider replacing the jail.conf uh, parser with QCL then all of this would be definitely required to preserve the expressiveness of the language. So now you can basically use the macro I implemented include de for include directory instead of just include of uh, blob files. And it will basically ignore everything up to the minimum depth to will stop transversing at the maximum depth you can figure so that you can control how deep it goes into the file system hierarchy. Uh, and then for each uh, directory or file through a list of uh, suffixes, you configure as a blobbing expression, it will then uh, decide for each of them if it either creates it as a new sub object named after the uh, base name strip of its uh, suffix, or um, if it is just to include the content as is in the current object of a parser. And you basically have four lists of uh, glob expressions you can put things in, and then the first one matching um, wins. And that means that you can have a directory named something, for example, uh, uh, templates.ink.d and if you have ink.d means that it's everything in there gets included into the current object uh, and it's a directory because you need .d and that's your convention then uh, it would just slot that in and you could put some links to other directories even in there and if the, those have the right suffix to be directly processed it would basically be hidden in the resulting tree so that you can have templates of templates and so on. So an include mechanism uh, for templates just falls off that as a color. Yep. What? Is that? Uh, <laughs> uh, Someone doing this. <laughs> Someone's getting a phone call, I guess. No, it's a cue. <laughs> that's a, uh, it's a cue. That's right. a okay. music from yeah. any award ceremony. Like, okay, up goes the right. music and we get German hits on accordion. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to oh. call it. Have a great one. I hope I can see a bunch of you tomorrow and the next day. Oh, and peace out. Yes, sir. No, it's Ed Kilroyd. Okay, make a note of it. Talk to you soon. Thanks all for joining. I will try to find some buttons here. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Like and subscribe. Boom. Called it. <laughs>